So the final presentation is my own. So it, this, was, this will be uh, self-moderated. Uh, so I need to apply the same standards to myself as I did to everyone else. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, winning the award probably for the longest title uh, at the conference. Uh, that's what academics do. Big titles may not necessarily mean uh, big findings. But this is something that I've been uh, working on for, for quite a while, on my own actually. Uh, I've tried to get some students involved and they're not interested at the moment. So if there's people interested in collaborating, I'd be happy to hear. Uh, I've always been interested in OSM, in the idea of the community and uh, what is it that makes this community very special and is there some computer science ways that we can look at the community. And if we look at this from a dictionary definition point of view, we, we can see the Oxford English Dictionary has lots of different definitions of community and it's what we really understand from community, a body of people sharing some culture, cultural or ethnic identity. Maybe in today's world it's an online facility where users, maybe not called people, but users can share information or data or topics, etc. But then linking into my talk today, a community can also be a group of animals or plants in the same place that are, are sharing uh, the conditions of the environment that they are, they are living in. And this is what some of the OSM community looked like from yesterday. So uh, a fantastic uh, wide-angle photograph from yesterday afternoon. So when I say some of, this is obviously not all of the OSM community there. Uh, there's lots of people around the world who are, who are not here today. And learning about our global community and local communities is actually very important in OSM. So you may be aware of uh, a current survey that's happening, or has just happened, that is asking some questions of the global and local communities in OpenStreetMap. And uh, Yust Shoup and I think wrote a very nice uh, summary of some of the responses that the, the survey gained. And I've just picked out visually uh, some places where the word community is emphasized. That the communities can vary from isolated mappers who do not really necessarily connect with other mappers to places where there's fully organized mapping presences. There's also a scope where people consider community varies from cities to region, from countries to places. But the crucial thing is that a community can do a lot more work together than it can apart. So it means that there should be an effort to connect up and support communities, but that is a major challenge. And what I'm trying to look at today is to seeing how connected or how similar different communities are. And just yesterday in one of the lightning talks, but also during the week on uh, on the OSM channels, OSM Teams, for example, is an idea to try and bring people together to work under an umbrella of a team as being a community who will work on a, a problem, work on some, some mapping area, etc., and work as a, as a mini community. And for those of you who are not aware, and sometimes academics are not aware of the amount of communication and amount of community that's in OSM, so for example, there are many platforms, channels, and forums that allow interaction on a community basis. So I've just screenshotted the example for Germany from uh, the website community.osm.be. And we can see here we have mailing lists, we have Telegram, we have Twitter, we have different types of mailing lists, we have IRC channels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's lots of different ways. So you can see trying to capture a community is not just an easy situation of finding a data set that represents the community, it's, it's quite a, a wide and varied uh, problem. So from the outside of OSM, what does OSM look like? And from the outside, if you're not really familiar with the project, you might think that OSM is a global, massively large crowd of mappers who work continuously together to build an open database of the world. And these mappers interact via forums uh, mapping parties, etc. But in reality, from the inside, OSM is a complex, multi layered, dispersed crowd of mappers. It's certainly a massive crowd. There's a large number of those that do a, a, a small number of those, excuse me, does a large amount of the work. Many people work on their own, and interaction does happen at Pacific events, and as we'll see from some talks later, 
mapping is caused by certain events and mapping is performed by, by different manners. So depending whether you're the uh, inside or outside the tent, the view can be a little bit different. Now, I'm sorry for this text-heavy slide, but uh, academic research has looked at characteristics of the mapper community for, for many, many years. And some of the key results that, that keep trickling down through, through papers over the years is that a small number of people do a large amount of the work. A, a very small proportion of mappers, or sorry, a very large, I keep switching large and small today, a large proportion of mappers only perform a small number of edits, then possibly leave. Other things like some mappers work on a global scale. They, they edit things all over the world, where others tend to be very locally based and only work in their own locality. Humanitarian uh, issues drive mapping and has contributed hugely to OSM over the, few, the last couple of years. And if we look at OSM on a life cycle type of basis, we begin to see patterns, for example, uh, difference between day versus night, difference between weekends and work days, Pacific event-driven mapping. So the, just a few slides to just summarize the existing research into community structure. Uh, some research done here in, in Heidelberg, for example, the OSM community has a vocal minority, which contribute over 95% of the data, but a silent majority. So there's a contribution in equality there. More recently, uh, a paper looked at this, the life cycle, and I think this diagram summar summarizes it quite nicely, where we find that people become visitors or explorers in OSM, they adopt and engage, and then some people then uh, detach or move away from the project for one reason or another. So uh, if uh, you can get your hands on this paper, a very, very detailed analysis of uh, the community in, in OSM in a life cycle manner. Something I did myself back uh, six years ago now was, was uh, applying graph theoretic approaches to looking at our mappers actually editing the work of other mappers. And we tried to calculate metrics like betweenness and centrality, et cetera, to see what would happen when we looked at places like Berlin, which have, if we look at the numbers here, this is the ranking of the mappers who are doing the most work, and how much work are they editing from other people in their community. So if we consider the city of Berlin as being a community. Moving on from that, uh, Stein and others then looked at that work of ours and came up with the idea of this idea of interlocking, so that mappers actually become interlocked with each other and I edit your work, you edit person C's work, and then person C edits me, and we find that we have a kind of a, a, an interlocking chain there. And that allowed a more quantitative look at the depth that people will, uh, will edit, so edit each other, and the breadth of how many uh, they would edit each other. And then finally, very recent work uh, by Guillaume Touya in, uh, in, in Paris and his student. Uh, again, these are just anonymous IDs, but looking at multi-layered networks and multiplex networks that try to see if editors or mappers act as moderators in, a, in an online sense of their, of their local community. So what you might find in some communities is that one particular mapper is it, the community is very contributor-centric, whereas in others, no particular mapper is dominant or is, is moderating what is happening. So, essentially, how are we looking at community structure in OSM? I suppose to summarize the, the, the literature very, very briefly and, and not very, very strongly, there's a focus on quantity and volume of contributions, co-editing, distinguishing contributors from the other, showing how different contributors are, and it's still difficult to compare one mapping community to another. We still haven't really decided on how uh, we're going to do that, and mostly many papers end up actually saying how complete a particular city is and drawing some inferences that that's a, a, a reflection of the community. So I had this idea a few years ago talking to a, a biology a friend of mine who we go running at lunchtime and uh, he he's, talks about ecosystems and communities. And I'll explain this diagram in, in a moment, but we have at, at the bottom of a, an ecological system an individual. Individuals live in populations. The population then lives within a community who are part of a, of a larger ecosystem. 
And I didn't steal this work from Jerry, uh, who I, could be here. He is. Uh, so J Jerry, uh, very cleverly in a blog post about 18 months ago, likened the way OSM data is collected to how species accumulate. Now, I'm not an ecologist, but I think if you can, uh, the, the link is there, and uh, I, I'd have a read of this. But looking at how some species are more easy to spot than others, some appear, some move away, and this is how data uh, happens to uh, change in OSM. Some things are there one day, some things are, are not there the next. But uh, there's a couple of seminal papers uh, coming out of e e ecological studies that look at diversity and similarity amongst uh, <coughs> ecosystems, particularly uh, aquatic ecosystems. Uh, Washington is one of them, and Hughes is another. Uh, and they have stood the test of time. They're back in the mid-'80s. And one of the quotes there is that there is a way to look at community structure based on two things, on diversity indices and similarity indices. So one thing we could do is combine the data on how abundant a species is into a single number, or we could look at how similar two samples actually are. So that leads us to the diagram we've seen a few minutes ago. And if we apply this to OSM, the individual mapper then is, <coughs> excuse me, the individual, a group of mappers then is that population. That group of mappers who might be a town or a community or a local group or an NGO, etc., build into a community which might be global, it might be OSM at a country level, and they fit into the ecosystem where OSM is sitting amongst lots of other crowdsourced initiatives, etc. So abundance then would be defined as uh, abundance of a particular mapper, types, and then the similarity is how similar two samples of mappers from different uh, communities or ecosystems actually are. So one of the most famous ways of looking at uh, communities is Pascal's uh, idea of gold, senior plus, senior, etc., which was published around 2012 with edits, but we, it's now probably better to look at change sets as a way of, of grouping together work. So if we just look at, at Heidelberg, I extracted the history data for Heidelberg using that relation there on the top left. So we see there's, there's, there's one person uh, responsible for 2,000 plus change sets, which is an incredible amount of work in, in Heidelberg. There's eight senior, 63, sorry, eight senior plus and 63, etc. So we have a lot of cases where we have the dominant species here is the newly registered. So the person who just commits uh, one change set. There may only be one edit in there, but it's a, a single change set. So just for a bit of variety uh, and a small file size, I just looked at Luxembourg then. Uh, so a country-sized community, uh, six gold then. And again, we see that uh, the, the lower number of change sets are the dominant species there. And finally, uh, Nottingham. Uh, is a, a place I like doing analysis on because uh, it's very much uh, com community driven. Uh, I haven't taken in most of the university area. Again, I've just extracted from the relation uh, for Nottingham City, but we're seeing a similar pattern. So, so is it easy to compare those numbers and say that uh, Nottingham is the same as Heidelberg or there's a difference between the two? Well, it's not so easy. So if we look at the papers I showed you a few minutes ago, some of the most famous indicators and indices, and uh, don't worry, these aren't actually that difficult. Uh, they're just really summations of, of different values. There's uh, one of the famous ones is called Simpson's uh, D. We've Maglev's D then for diversity. Shannon's index is the one you'll know from information theory. Uh, if you have a computer science background, you'll have heard of it. Herbert's Pi, and then Macintosh's Ecological Distance. Now, I, it's a bit too much to read them all, but essentially they all are on a reasonably simple scale. For example, Simpson is that if you get a score of zero, the population is infinitely diverse, and a score of one means there's no diversity, so that means the species are all exactly the same, uh, the individuals are all exactly the same there. Uh, Shannon's index then has a maximum of the log of the number of species, so we can at least see where the, the level is. Uh, an interesting one is Hurlburt's pie, is that 
if you are an individual in a community, basically what are the chances of you inter interacting with every other individual in the community? Uh, so obviously bigger communities, it may not be as possible. So some backgrounds and assumptions before I show you the results. Uh, we use the OSM history from uh, Geofabric, who I'm always indebted to for making history extraction easy for me. Uh, we just look at the OSM uh, user IDs. We don't import the usernames, so I can't point out specific people. At the moment, I've just considered the editing and creation of, of nodes, ways, relations, and tags. I haven't looked at if people are doing stuff with geometry, so I'll move on to that, hopefully. And we assume that OSM communities in different regions would share uh, similar community characteristics. Now, I'm sorry, I, I'm really bad at drawing nice visualizations, uh, so I'm, I'm good at, uh, at these type of tables. Just want to draw something out that there's not a really very clear picture here of how similar uh, any of these, these communities are. This is the number of, of contributors, in, uh, distinct contributors. This is the number of groups from Pascal's groupings. So we can see that there's reasonable diversity within, within all of them. If we look at Shannon, for example, the maximum, meaning that all species would be equally common, is a little bit, given that it's a log scale, it's a little bit away from what we would, would say that all, this, all species groups are like each other, because we know they're not. Most of the groups there are contributing a small number of change sets. And then that Macintosh, for example, that all individuals are, are different if it's one, that's, I think, a good score there, is showing that there are differences between uh, the individuals. If, if, we, if we actually create uh, some quantiles on this, so just split them up reasonably roughly into uh, 12 quantiles, so 11 species groups, we see these numbers changing again. Uh, I suppose the one to note, really, is that the, this has caused a little bit of a problem saying that there's less diversity then when we have this number of groups, because I think well, by just splitting it up into quantiles in sorted order is probably not the cleverest way to, uh, to do it. The, the last result is uh, something that I, I really, really enjoy, uh, is looking at Pacific mapping activities. So uh, I just think there's something wonderful about mapping post boxes and benches, because most people walk by them and never think about them. Uh, in Nottingham uh, City, there's 790 of those, 52 mappers involved, and possibly one high-volume mapper over there who has edited uh, or done something with uh, at least uh, on, on 426 occasions. Heidelberg, again, scales up this number of post boxes and benches, and Luxembourg. So what I'm saying here is now, let's forget everything else, and let's just assume that the only thing there is... Uh, post boxes and benches. And now we find that the individuals within species groups are starting to become reasonably similar. So I, I have no nice visualization here to point this out, but uh, if you look at these numbers hard enough uh, when the presentation is online, uh, it's a little bit uh, clearer. So what I'm hoping to do is to expand this a little bit and be more rigorous in how I, I pick out the groups. But I was happy to see that smaller Pacific community groups then become more common uh, if, if we look at something very Pacific. So, future work, because this is really only starting, I want to do some more rigorous comparison of communities from different areas. I've just picked out three at the moment. To try and think about different ways to create the groups, uh, analyze maybe over different regions, over time scales. Uh, I'd be very interested in looking at species development using a qualitative approach. So ask people how they map, and then try and reflect that in the groups that we create. Uh, if I was mathematically brave enough, I would look at something more complex like the Hill numbers, which are uh, a more complex framework for uh, species abundance. But I, I, I need to uh, improve my probability uh, analysis a bit. Eventually, this is going on to GitHub. It's a very simple workflow. Uh, OSM convert just takes the Geo fabric data files, uh, Pyosium I'm indebted to, uh, and then this goes into PostGIS. So it's a very simple uh, flow of, uh, of data. Just a free plug before I go, we, I am on a different scale. We have a workshop in Zurich next month on legal, ethical, and privacy factors in, in crowdsource information. It's free registration. 
I know that doesn't mean a lot in Zurich when it's quite expensive to, to go there, but uh, we still have uh, registration opened, uh, it's still available. Just uh, Google for lesson 20, 2019 and you'll find it. And just to thank the academic, uh, from the academic track, thank, thank the organizers for facilitating this, and of course OpenStreetMap for being the inspiration for this research. Thank you. So I think we can take a question or two before coffee. Patricia. So it's so fascinating. I think there's so many applications for you know, how you can understand the different communities and how they interact. Um, I'm sensitive to the problem that you're finding in how you define those communities in your future research. Have you thought about how you would address the modifiable arrow unit problem and like uh, gerrymandering yes, kind of issues. Uh, yeah, How the, do the, you do that? Yeah, you, every, every minute I, I do this, I think about this, and I will warn my students then about, about that Pacific. Uh, and, and this is where I think maybe something like the post box benches might be able to not really resolve it, but looking at something Pacific that we, we could cordon off, maybe even something from a, an ecological point of view. So if we, if we look at a certain species of of, of, of plant, and we know it doesn't grow somewhere else, well then at least we have, we have bounded the area. But yeah, th that's what I'm juggling with, to try and find, I, I do feel uncomfortable about using a city as a community. Uh, then I feel equally uncomfortable about drilling down too far, because I know that if you just go down to a block level or a, an admin level, that doesn't work either. So it's trying to come up with, with the right region uh, is, is something that I've, I, I've struggled with. So I'd be happy to hear uh, suggestions on, uh, on how we could do that. Jerry. Jerry Clough, uh, SK53. I, I'd just like to follow on directly from that because um, there's a specific problem about using the Nottingham bounding box as representing the city. Um, for very long and complicated historical reasons, the Region, the administrative area is much smaller than the actual practical area of the city. And actually two of the gold star mappers happen to live just within half a kilometre outside. And it's probably not an accurate reflection of our actual yeah. community. Um, but, uh, but that's a very specific problem in Nottingham. If, yeah. if, if you look at my shop data, you can see that, that there, where I took all European cities over 200,000 and looked at... Yes. History of mapping of shops. Yeah, and, and then of course just, the university is outside of that polygon that I've um, showed there as well, is it? The university's in there, but there's it's an enormous there. student community just outside. Yes, yes. There's a question up the very back there. We'll go for the gentleman at the back. Okay, yeah. Um, two, two remarks. One thing is about species. I, I personally think it's not, well, a good term for that, right? Because where, where people and kind of, well, basically you could grow a senior mapper or a gold standard mapper just by time, right? People might be in for just a short time and therefore there's no, no chance mm. to, to already become, become senior. Um, so I think that is something to, well, that's just the, the phrasing, but also I think it has to do with the analysis, right? You, I think it would be fine to control for the time, since somebody is, is contributing, when you could go for the edits over time or something like that. And, and then at a different level, also comparing communities, comparing cities, I think you also need to control um, for well, basic for co-founding factors between the different cities, kind of are they mapped uh, and an equal amount, right? Otherwise, you might compare them differently. So people go for the map things first, then post boxes might be at the very end. If other things are already mapped, so if you start a map and everything else is mapped, you go for post boxes. So therefore, this comparison, I think you would need to, uh, to consider also the, the, the factor of the cities, kind of how, how they differ. Do not compare apples and oranges. Yeah, that's a, it's a great point, and something I mentioned in, in the future work was to look at this on a time scale, and I, 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 because that would help filter out problems that if, if a senior or a gold mapper did leave the area uh, five years ago, that they, they are not part of the analysis now, 
But uh, yeah, I'm aware of the phrasing, the, the, the species thing. I think we, we need, I just need to look for the right words there. Uh, and, uh, but but I, I, I get your, I absolutely agree then with, with, with those definition issues about the, about the region size and certainly about the time scales that uh, maybe to look at, at uh, mapping parties or Pacific events that, that, that would cause uh, additional mapping. And then, as you said, then the type of objects as well, uh, what has been mapped and uh, what's there before, during and after the events that we're looking at. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, I'll have to take, uh, this lady here was first and then you're the last. Yeah, and then we will stop for coffee. Hi, uh, very interesting. I'm curious if you've um, looked at or thought of looking at the communities and whether they're mapping locally or if they're mapping remote locations and if there's some, some, some similarities in those two groups, what they do? Yeah, so at the moment we are just, uh, as I said, we're, we just look at what is edited and created within that bounding polygon essentially, but that would be an extension then to see that if you are uh, editing within there, are you editing other places and, and to control or factor that in. So that would be an, an extended part of the analysis, yes. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Thank you. Uh, this is a bit tangential but related. You had a paper in 2015 about observing an OSM mapping part, it's kind of an ethnography. So what are your latest thoughts about that kind of method to approach this? If you just repeat the question, I just didn't... Uh, you you had a bit of an ethnographic work of a mapping party in 2015 and in a paper in 2015. Yes. Uh, so what are your latest thoughts about that, that kind of path in studying the structure of a community, kind of an ethnographic approach? Yeah, well, the, 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 so the, the question is about looking at, at mapping parties and, and the structure. So the mapping parties I've been involved in have, have all been a, a learning process because uh, we... we, we at a mapping party, you realize the value of experienced mappers within, within your local community because uh, it's in a mapping party, uh, uh, let's call them a gold or a senior, ma senior mappers, can really help inspire the new people that are entering the community, but also give you that local information that, that will explain some things that people might, might fi find confusing, maybe about boundary information, about uh, particular Local, inf local information that may be confusing to a person not, not there. So I haven't done any work recently on, on mapping parties, I have been involved in some, but again, the, the crucial take home question is that if, if you are doing a mapping party, it's, it's in your best interest to have some experienced people there who can, because they can help with all parts of the process and actually the, the rising tide carries everybody then, so that actually inspires the, the new people to to work together, but it needs to be goal-driven, the mapping party. Some of the papers I've read recently, if there's not a, a, a more long-term goal, if it's just a short-term goal, some people can lose interest and just never appear again in, in OSM. Okay, so I will thank you for the response to my talk. I will thank you also for the response to all of the talks in this session. Uh, it's been a great start to the academic uh, track today, so we'll have more at 11.30. So thanks again, and see you later. <laughs>